Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide toward a night of peaceful, restful sleep as we unwind with the classic novel Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. We will explore the foggy streets of London and stunning, expansive marshes as we follow young Pip, an orphan, on his journey to becoming an adult. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find comfort in the space that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Really feel the weight of your body as it sinks deeper and deeper down into the mattress, releasing any tension that it may be carrying. Here and now, there are no expectations. There is no to-do list. You have done all you need to do for the day, and now you are relaxing. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice as I guide you through our story, you are beginning to rest. You are giving your body the gift it deserves by nourishing it. And as I continue to guide you deeper and deeper into relaxation, you will be giving your mind that gift as well. All you have to do is keep your body in that comfortable position and open your imagination with me as we embark on this journey together. First, let us travel to the marshes of Kent, where our story with young Pip will begin. With your eyes still comfortably closed for a moment, I want you to try and imagine that your room is filled with fog. Picture it as the fog rolls in, slinking in from under the door and sliding in around the edges of the windows. It is thick and white, like clouds that have dropped from the heavens and rolled into your room to give it this magical feel. As you breathe in, feel the cool, stormy air that the fog brings with it. In the air, taste the aroma of willows, black poplar trees, and forest loam, all mingling with the unmistakably refreshing scent of the fog itself. And as you breathe out, imagine that fog rippling away from you, blown back by your breath, as you exhale any tension or stress that you have been carrying. With your breath, you are giving yourself permission to truly relax. Imagine the fog slowly sinking down over your body. As it does so, you are enveloped in this blanket of white. It is cool to the touch, and yet it causes your muscles to relax. Feel as the fog washes over your face, encouraging you to stop squinting your eyes and to simply allow them 
to be naturally closed. Feel as the fog washes over your jaw, encouraging you to lower it, allowing it to naturally fall without clenching your teeth. As you unclench your jaw, feel your ears tense less and your neck relax more and more. Feel as your tongue falls from the roof of your mouth, landing on the base instead where it belongs. Then feel the blanket of fog as it rests gently across your chest, as it sinks down against you. Notice any tension you may be carrying in your chest. If your breaths are short and shallow, try to slow down the pace. That fog slowly presses against you more and more, allowing you to breathe more deeply, more from your stomach rather than your chest. As you do so, feel your heartbeat slow, finding a sweet, steady pace that's telling your body it is okay and that it can relax. The cloud of fog wraps around your legs and arms now, leaving a tingly, fresh feeling on them like tea tree oil or fresh, invigorating eucalyptus. As it provides you with this sensation, it urges you to let your hands and feet relax fully, letting go of any tension in them. Your fingers unfurl and spread out on the mattress or around the blankets. The weight of the day that you've been carrying in your legs and your shoulders melts away. And now that the fog has touched upon your muscles, allowing them to relax more and more, it lifts slightly, dancing across your ceiling. In it, you can almost see the shadows of trees, the faint outline of clouds that are a monochromatic mosaic in the sky, in a strange place on a strange day. In the distance, you can hear the sound of a horse clomping down a cobblestone street, and far, far in the distance, you swear you can hear the angelic song of carolers as they sing into the cool December air. You are in a sleepy village set in the coastal marshes of Kent, England, and it is Christmas morning and far down the road from you, there is a little boy who is about to meet someone who will change his life, whether he's aware of it or not. Pip walked down the cobblestone street, his hands tucked into his wool jacket to keep warm in the December air. It was an uncharacteristically warm December, a December with no snow or frost, which meant one thing, fog. When Pip had awakened, he had gazed out of his single pane window to see a curtain of pure white fog. The droplets of condensation clung to his window 
making their way down in wavering lines that almost looked like art to him. Perhaps it was the fog's way of painting, its way of leaving a mark that would be around even after it was gone. Pip had stepped onto the cold floor, pulled on some toasty warm socks, and put on his finest winter coat before he slipped out the door without anyone seeing him. Though he was a bright, kind boy, sometimes he just wanted to go about things alone. And that fine Christmas morning, he did. He journeyed down the cobblestone street with no smile on his face and no song in his heart. For today, he was going to visit his parents and his siblings. Something that would be joyous for most. But, as an orphan, Pip found himself walking to the town cemetery alone. It was a beautiful walk. The marshes were lined with small trees that thrived in the wet climate. The earth smelled of fertile soil and fresh flowing water, and frogs and toads croaked with joy as they hopped over the wet grass. Overhead, birds flit from branch to branch, singing their song to the universe as they tried their hardest to avoid big droplets of rain that fell down from the monochrome mosaic of storm clouds overhead. While the graveyard may have been a spooky place for most children, Pip was a bit of an outlier in more ways than one. As an orphan, he was rather accustomed to traveling to the cemetery to pay his respects to his mother and father, who both left him too soon. Pip knelt down in front of the fog-shrouded gravestones. He reached his tiny hand out, dusting aside moss that waywardly hung over the names and cleaned them as the fog seemed to thicken around them. He wished his late family a Merry Christmas with a smile on his face, telling them he wished they could still be here. And nearly as soon as he put this wish out into the world, there was a rustle from behind the gravestone. To his surprise, a man popped out from behind it. He looked rough around the edges, with a rather untamed look in his eyes. And only after a moment did Pip realize he was wearing leg shackles. He was an escaped convict from the local prison. The man swiftly grabbed Pip, demanding that Pip bring him food and a file so he could get his leg irons off. Afraid of being hurt by the man, Pip slunk out of the garden his heart racing as he returned back to the home where he was staying. Because he was an orphan, Pip lived with his older sister and her husband, Joe Gargery, who was a kindly blacksmith. Pip snuck past them as he returned, stealthily grabbing a file from Joe's toolkit and taking Christmas pie 
and Christmas brandy to give to the convict. He felt a pang of sorrow as he stole the items, but he did not feel he had any other choice. He brought them back to the convict, who was shivering cold and hungry in the marshes. Pip looked at the man with pity and treated him with kindness, sending him hope that he could warm up and be well. The convict was surprised at Pip's kindness. Pip returned home to his sister and brother-in-law's house, grateful to finally be separated from the convict. He spent the afternoon standing over the figgy pudding, stirring it for hours. The sticky sweet aroma washed over him as the warmth of the stove dried him from his journey out into the fog. It was far from the Christmas he was imagining, but he was grateful to be inside and warm, unlike the convict, who was still out in the marshes somewhere. When it was time for the pie, it was nowhere to be found. Pip averted his eyes to the ground, desperate to keep his pie stealing a secret. But then there was a knock at the door. A group of soldiers stood at attention there, the hazy fog silhouetting them. Pip's heart leapt when he saw them. And when the men asked if Joe could repair some broken shackles, Pip knew immediately what this was all about, and he felt a sense of worry for the convict who he had helped. Joe and Pip accompanied the soldiers deep into the marshes to find not just the convict who Pip spoke to, but another convict as well. They traipsed through the marshes, breathing in the sweet, invigorating air, and telling tales as they made their way deeper and deeper into the countryside. Finally, they found the two convicts fighting with one another. Quickly and easily, the two men were captured and shackled by the soldiers. Pip felt a sense of worry, wondering whether or not he would be caught for assisting the convict earlier. But the convict looked at him with a sparkle in his eye. The convict told the soldiers that he was the one who snuck into the home and stole the pie and the brandy. Pip felt the cool wave of relief wash over him. The convict was willing to take the fall for Pip. Pip watched as the soldiers took the two convicts back through the fog, disappearing forever. For the next few months, Pip carried the sense of guilt and wonder with him. He often found himself contemplating whether or not he had done the right thing by helping the convict, and about whether or not he had done the right thing by not being honest with Joe about the incident. He vowed to try and put that Christmas day and the foggy marshes behind him, and instead tried to focus on school. School was a haven for Pip, a place where he could chit-chat with people his own age and learn to read and write, something both his sister and her husband had never learned to do. Often, Joe would sit, admiring the writing that Pip did 
as he read it aloud to Joe. It was the greatest sense of accomplishment Pip ever felt. Looking at the dark ink on the scroll before him, knowing that he created the world on it, that he was able to speak without even opening his mouth. One day, when Pip and Joe were chatting, Pip's sister slipped into the room with Pip's uncle Pumblechook, who had a satisfied smile on his face. He gleefully told Pip that he had wonderful news. He had arranged for Pip to go play at Miss Havisham's house, a rich, well-known spinster who lived in a nearby town. She was the wealthiest person by far in the area, and there were high hopes in the family that her fortune may possibly be passed down to Pip, if Miss Havisham was so inclined. Pip had no say in the matter, of course, so he simply smiled and agreed to go. That night, he was given a hot bath, lavishing in a feeling unlike any other. He sank against the warm water and felt his entire body relax. He was reminded of that cold night out on the marshes with that strange man and wondered how much the convict would have appreciated a nice, warm bath like the one he was having. The next morning, Pip awakened to the house buzzing. His sister and Joe were elated that he was being sent to Miss Havisham's, and their hope for the future was clear. They put Pip in the finest suit he owned, which wasn't particularly fine by any means and sent him on his way with his uncle Pumblechook. As the two journeyed to Sati's house, the home of Miss Havisham, Uncle Pumblechook quizzed young Pip on multiplication problems and etiquette, telling him that it was necessary for him to make a good first impression on the family. When they rolled up the long, winding driveway to Satis house, the stunning manor, Pip was speechless. It was a home more beautiful than anything he had ever seen before. It was extravagant, with so many windows and a large, expansive garden that was flourishing with flowers of all species and colors. It was the kind of home Pip dreamed about often, where he would be able to play in the gardens and relax in the soothing sunshine all hours of the day. When they rolled up to the gate, they were surprised to find it locked. The grand front doors suddenly opened, and a young girl about Pip's age headed down the front steps, her heels click, click, clicking in a magical way. Pip's eyes drifted up to the face of the girl. It was as if the sun, high in the sky, was illuminating her and only her. She had a face with delicate, beautiful features. Her cheeks were a bright, rosy red, and her eyes reminded Pip of the ocean. The blue seemed to pop against the green and reds of the garden behind her. She was clothed in an extravagant dress 
made of cloth that was surely more than what Joe made in an entire month. Pip could feel his heart pitter-pattering in his chest. He had never seen someone so lovely, so divine, so beautiful. She looked the way poetry felt. She somehow reminded him of the comfort of that warm bath and the great sense of freedom and adventure that came any time he stepped out into the marshes. He was enamored with her. But when she approached the gate, she was cold and rude to Uncle Pumblechook. She sent him away with a flick of her wrist, telling him that Miss Havisham had no interest in seeing him. He walked away, wounded with his tail between his legs. She motioned for Pip to follow her and led him up the staircase without uttering a single word to him. When she was forced to meet his eyes on occasion, she made sure she was giving him the coldest, most indifferent look that she could muster. And yet, Pip was still mesmerized, determined to win her over. The mansion was ornate and dark, lit only by candles that flickered against the wall and filled the entire building with a honey-like aroma. This honey scent mingled with the soothing scent of antiques and old books, which made Pip feel a bit sleepy. The young girl led Pip into Miss Havisham's room, a room lined with flickering candles that illuminated extravagant wallpaper adorned with vines and flowers, certainly purchased from an artisan in some distant country. Miss Havisham, a shell of a woman, sat in front of the mirror in a faded wedding dress. Her normal attire that had everyone in town sniggering behind her back. Pip tried to put on a brave face, not wanting to insult this woman in the slightest. After formal introductions, Miss Havisham instructed Pip to play cards with Estella, the young girl who Pip was infatuated with. Pip's heart leapt at this order. Finally, he would be able to interact with her, to show her what a smart boy he was. But that is not at all how it went. Estella spent the entire game insulting Pip. She made fun of his low social class and his manners, which she considered to be unrefined. And yet, Pip could not keep his eyes off of her. It was as if the girl had cast a spell on him. When Pip returned home, he told grand lies to Joe and his sister about his trip to the Satis house. He told them he had been fed cakes for hours and the veal cutlet was stolen out of a silver basket by the family dogs. But as the guilt began to sink in, Pip resigned himself to tell the truth. When he told Joe about how he had truly felt at the Satis house, about how Estella had insulted him, Joe put a comforting hand on Pip's shoulder he warned him that for now, it would be best for Pip to remain in his social class. But someday, Pip may exceed at moving up in the world, 
only if he is honest and takes a path with no lies, no deceit, and hard work. But that night, all Pip could imagine was a life with Estella, a grand life in a manor where they would eat cake all day and veal all night. There was nothing he wanted more in the world, and so he set out to make himself wealthy, to be a successful man with a high social standing. He took extra lessons at school and worked hard to improve himself and his manners. He began to visit the Satis house more and more, spending long hours there with Miss Habisham and Estella. He was motivated, hoping that Miss Havisham would take him on and help him become a true gentleman with a high social standing. As he spent more time with Estella, he found himself falling more and more in love with her. Whenever they played cards, he would steal glances as she put her cards down, dreaming of the day he could brush her hair out of her face, dreaming of the day when he could kiss her on the forehead. Over time, he felt that Estella was becoming more and more kind to him. But any time she was kind to him, Miss Havisham would lean down to Estella and whisper into her ear, break his heart. But Pip was far too enamored with Estella to even notice what Miss Havisham was saying. One day, Miss Havisham offered to give money for Pip to be bound as an apprentice blacksmith working for Joe. At that moment, Pip's whole world shifted. That meant that Miss Havisham had no desire to take him on, to make him into a gentleman. He would always be a man of low social standing in her eyes. Devastated, Pip still agreed, and Joe received her money, making Pip Joe's official apprentice. For the next few years, Pip worked as an apprentice. Whenever he gazed into the burning hot forge, he imagined Estella. He feared that he would never be the man for her, that he would never be able to hold her hand as he had always dreamt. He was to be a boy living in poverty for the rest of his life. But one day, something rather strange happened. A mysterious lawyer named Jaggers knocked on the blacksmith's door with news. A secret benefactor had given Pip a large fortune. Pip was astounded and had to pinch himself to make sure he was not dreaming. He was to come to London at once to begin his education as a gentleman. The very thing that had been his dream all along. Delighted by the news, Pip hastily packed his things and joined the lawyer on a trip to London, where his new life was to begin. The whole journey to London, Pip only had one thing on his mind. He believed that Miss Havisham was the benefactor, and that she sent him away to get an education 
so he could eventually marry Estella. It seemed that all his dreams were finally coming true. Once he arrived in London, Pip befriended a young man named Herbert and his father, Matthew. Matthew took Pip in, teaching him gentlemanly ways and educating him even further. Herbert's friendship was almost as great as the fortune that Pip had received. He was grateful to finally have a real friend, a true friend who did not ridicule him for his upbringing or his uncivilized ways. Instead, Herbert worked to help Pip become the man he was meant to be. Pip decided that once he was 21 and starts receiving income from his fortune, he would secretly help Herbert get his business off the ground by investing in it. For several years, Pip and Herbert enjoyed their lives together, adventuring side by side and racking up debts as they explored the streets of London together. It was the greatest freedom either of them had ever had, and they were grateful to share it. Pip spoke often of Estella, which always made Herbert roll his eyes. Pip was happy, still believing that one day he would finally be able to be with Estella once he was a proper gentleman and once his fortune was his own. But then, one foggy night, there was a knock at his door. When he opened it, he was stunned to see the man before him, a man he had long forgotten. It was the escaped convict he had helped all those years ago, an old man named Magwitch. Pip wondered what had brought the strange man here, and he learned that Magwitch was actually the source of the fortune, not Miss Havisham, as Pip had assumed. When Pip treated Magwitch with such kindness in the cemetery that day, Magwitch knew he had to help Pip any way that he could. He dedicated his life to making money for Pip and made a fortune in Australia just to help the young boy become a gentleman. Pip was shocked to learn of this news. Knowing that Magwitch was still on the run from the authorities once more, Pip was compelled to help him try and escape. And as they prepared to help him escape, Pip learned more things that changed his life. Magwitch's former partner in crime, Compeyson, had abandoned Miss Havisham at the altar when they were young, devastating her. She wore a dress to mourn her lost relationship with him. Furious at this betrayal, Miss Havisham made it her goal to raise Estella to break men's hearts, just as her own heart had been broken. Before he was able to help Magwitch escape, Pip paid a visit to Sati's house and was very surprised when Miss Havisham begged him for forgiveness. She was fond of the man that Pip had become and longed for him to set her free from her guilt. Sad to see the old woman in pain, Pip agreed, forgiving her 
for her transgressions against him. Pip's escape with Magwitch didn't go as planned, and Magwitch was recaptured by the police. But he was not sad with this outcome. He promised Pip that this was the way it was meant to be. Feeling that he was being forgiven by God for all his years on the run. With not much left for him in England, Pip set out with Herbert to work in the mercantile trade. The whole time, he found himself staring at the sea, dreaming of Estella. Many years later, the day came for them to be reunited. Pip found her in the now ruined garden of the Satis house. She gave Pip a smile, and when she spoke to him, her words weren't laced with cruelty or contempt. She was a kind woman now a far cry from the angry child that she once was. Pip gazed into her eyes, still feeling the affection for her that he had as a young boy all those years ago. Hand in hand, the two finally walked out of the garden together. Deep within his soul, Pip knew that the two would never part again. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>